the recording. Thank you. That will help us with notes since we don't have a note taker today. Um, okay, so the, one of the things I thought might be helpful, Leslie, is just to kind of um, summarize very quickly kind of what we accomplished last time because, and, and I, you don't have to, my, my sense of it is that we, uh, we focused quite a lot on two areas, the annex and the Crooker district. And we talked on the annex about, I think we made some decisions to kind of include a certain area, and we'll look at the map in a, in a couple of minutes so we can understand what we're saying here. There are certain parcels that are along um, 201, sort of North Main Street, whatever. And those are gonna be included in the upper village. And there's certain areas that are gonna be just sort of taken out of this project because they will get handled in Kirk's work and they are the school and athletic fields. And I think we removed some of the light industrial. Right. Some of that didn't reflect as actual decisions in the notes, which is why I'm going through that here, because I think that was important. Um, I think that was the main stuff in the, in the and oh, did we remove one building type? from the annex, we're not doing the warehouse or something. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah, and then we talked about the Crooker district and um, we talked about, what did we talk about? We talked about the, the suburban storefront. Right, the suburban storefront being um, with planning board permission and limiting drive-throughs and sort of placing some design constraints on drive-throughs. That's my memory. Um, and knowing that the Crooker District is going to be um, largely subject to the MPD um, process which is the master plan development process for, for areas that are four acres and larger. I think that kind of hits most of the points mm -hmm. in terms of actual decision-making, not just review, <laughs> right? Right, okay. right. So can you tell me a little bit about who's, so is everybody that's on this call in CPIC now? Is this the CPIC? The only person who's not yet on CPIC is Pete Bono, um, and Pete has submitted an application to join CPIC, but okay. the process, as you probably know, is that, that there's an interview by the select board, and um, that hasn't happened yet. So, yeah, and who we're, who we're missing today is Angela, Rick, and Andy Muncy but hopefully they will catch up through the recording. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, so we'll go ahead. Okay. And we have the full complement of the, or almost all of the planning department. We don't have the code enforcement guy, but. <laughs> or our admin assistant. Or what? Uh, or the admin, admin assistant. assistant, that's right. Yeah. So at but this, Andy? Has a thing, yeah, um, I, I just want to make sure I understand what you said in the uh, the decisions in the Annex District and in Crooker, were those decisions made or were we just still discussing those? And the reason I ask is I've got a lot of pushback um, from people in the community about, about the drive-throughs being that in today's world, in the post-pandemic, a lot of companies are structuring themselves for people to come and drive through and pick up stuff as opposed to to just milling around and going in a store so they had questions and i couldn't really tell them whether we had made a decision or we were still in the discussion stage well <laughs> um i think our consensus 
um, was that we would like to limit drives throughs mm -hmm. that we have plenty of them would like would like not to have any more understanding that there may be a need for some but we would like them to be limited and to have certain design specifications what we're aiming for i think the thing andy to help reflect back to anybody who's pushing or interested in learning is to remind them the very clear desire from people in the town to have more of a walkable town center. And if we continue emphasizing vehicles, we're not going to have that with any level of safety. I, think. I don't think that's, that's I don't think that's scary. the case. I don't think that's the pushback at all. Walkability is a huge issue. Having a a second or a first downtown area is a priority. I mean, an additional downtown area yep. or additional walkable area. But yep. that doesn't mean on the outskirts or in certain areas, you wouldn't have drive throughs And when you say limited, I don't, did we decide 25% or 50% or what did, I don't think no. we made any concrete decision, right? No, no concrete decision. But but when you're talking about outskirts, what we're we're talking today about the center of town growth area that involves Topsom Fair Mall and involves the Crooker District. It involves no. I, I mean the outskirts of the mini area of, of of say say if you had a new downtown area in the Crooker quadrant. I mean the outskirts of that quadrant, not of uh -huh. the community. Okay. But we don't know. I mean, no one knows well, what that's going to look like until you submit something. But. I just wanted to know where we stood. Did we make a decision on 25%, 50%? I, I didn't hear a number. We haven't come down with that level of specificity, I believe. And okay. I, th I think one of the things it would be helpful to hear as we go forward from the from Leslie is sort of is, you know, what kind of guidance do, does she need with regard to things like this, where there are some strong feelings in terms of um you know, the, the main street plan called for no drive throughs, um, you know, and, and we, we clearly would like to limit that. Susan, could I ask whether the discussion around drive throughs was in any way related to concerns about climate change? You were here Pat, for that discussion. So um, oh, well, I'm trying to recall whether or not it, it did not touch upon that specifically. Okay. So um, I think it would be helpful to just get right into our agenda, having kind of done a little bit of summary of our discussion last time. And what we have from Leslie, thank you so much, is um, kind of an annotated agenda, which is so helpful. Um, the folks who are here in person have a copy. Um, I think all of us have a copy, good. Thanks to Mark, yeah. And um, if it's all right with you, Leslie, I'll turn it over to you for um, to take it to our next steps in terms of, I think a lot is gonna come out in terms of looking at the uh, map. Um, you, you've done actually two maps. You did a map and then a, a tweak and a second map. Um, yeah, yeah, I just, I would like to say that, so the, at the last meeting, one of the things that I got out of it, one of the big things that I got out of it was that the structure of the code as written is good. Um, that the, the structure of the current draft, um, that was worked through with Kate is solid. And what we're doing here is just confirming some of those comments that were made um and discussing comments that weren't clear or maybe where decisions need to be made um in order to you know kind of kind of take the next step forward um and so this agenda is written um in response to those very specific comments and some of the confirmations that um you know that i i just wanted to um revisit from the last meeting at the end if we have time 
Um, okay. So I just wanted to to make that clear because I I think there's some new faces and and you know we're not sort of starting from square one at this point. We have pushed and pulled this draft of this code multiple times, and in terms of the structure, we're pretty good. Um, but we do have some very specific questions um, that we need to uh, finalize. Um, so the first item that I have is the biggest item, and again, that's revisiting the annex discussion just to kind of wrap it up. Um, from last time, and I did prepare a revised map, and just for those of you who weren't on my email chain because I, I didn't know you were out there, and Andy, I don't think you're on it either, so I need to make sure um, that you get added. Um, no, I was this, on it. I was oh, on you it. were? Okay, good. Great. Okay. Um, so just to... Uh, to confirm. So what I've done here, this is a map that Kate created that I do not have access to. Um, and I need to get with Julie at some point to kind of figure out how we're going to move forward on that. But so I've sort of graphically <laughs> revised it in um, in Illustrator. But um, I think we're reducing the annex area to just these three parcels. So this parcel here is the old um, base housing. Um, with these two sort of circular drives. There's a little sliver parcel between the school and that, that I believe, um, and again, I don't have ownership information, so I need to confirm that that's not part of the school site. Um, Angela was really knowledgeable about that, but we need to confirm that. And then this long parcel here um, that follows the, the high school site, which is here. Um, and the idea here is that this would now become mainly residential. Um, and what we did also was we pulled out, uh, so we pulled out the middle school, which are these two parcels, maybe this little one. We pulled out the high school. We pulled out this because I think it's somehow associated with the high school. It's the adult right. education. Yep. Adult, adult ed. Okay, great. And then we pulled out the um, concrete um, precast, yeah. precast yeah. place. Um, these three parcels in here are, I believe, all three of them are part of Wicked Joe Joe's. Yeah, Wicked Joe's. There's a lot of Joe coffees. Um, <laughs> um, so these three are part of the Wicked Joe's, and we also pulled that out because it is essentially a light industrial site. I just yep. wanted to confirm that. Okay. Okay. So this is what we're left with, with the annex. Is that right. your, your recollection? Okay. That's right. And, and I think just to let folks know that, you know, there was some discussion of doing some mixed use in terms of allowing some commercial activity. And there was a very helpful comment to say that, you know, there is a road that connects and there have been some concerns you know, with Highland Green and the Highlands, and there, there have it, it might be concerning to have lots of increased traffic there, where there's there's already some traffic around the school, and, and so to limit that to residential at the moment. Okay, that's where we are. Yep. Okay, so confirming that that's one of my bullets on the agenda. There should not be even a corner commercial if this were to redevelop somehow. Um, in this development. Um, so it would only be, and just to also confirm, multi-unit and row housing. So we're looking for multiple, multi-unit or single family attached. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And are you muted? Are you muted? He's not muted. There was one. Oh, oh, he's muted now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, electronically challenged. Um, the, the comment I wanted to, to make about uh, the annex and uh, having having anything commercial in the in the newly defined area is that we really need housing. And I think it would be unfortunate to take up any space that could be used for housing by commercial when we have it elsewhere. Okay. All right. Let, 
Let's just open up that question quickly, not to bypass the two planning staff here in terms of are, are we being too strict in not allowing a corner store? Um, I just remember growing up how really important our little corner store was and how important mm -hmm. Rusty's has become in a certain area. Although we, we don't want a proliferation of mixed use would it be wise to allow for, not to demand, but to allow for a little bit of um, commercial just to provide for that if a developer wanted to create that option in the neighborhood where somebody could So walk. notionally, if we're thinking about the 15-minute neighborhood concept, mm -hmm. I mean, that almost implies the need for something like, a, you know, a neighborhood commercial store, mm -hmm. Well, there's schools there already, you know, so that people don't have to get into their cars and drive to the Thompson Fair Mall or wherever in order to pick up a carton of milk. That was, I would, that would, that was my thought as well. And I work out of the adult ed center um, <clears throat> between the two school buildings. And it occurs to me, those people that work there full time might want to walk to a store and get a coffee or a sandwich yeah. or sandwich. Yeah. And they, I just don't know the viability of those kinds of mom and pop shops anymore. But if somebody wanted to give it a go and there was enough housing in the area that provided an income source, I think mm -hmm. it's something maybe we should consider so allowing. Maybe for. something along the lines of Rusty's or something. Something like that, like that yeah. without the gas station. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Neighborhood store. So I think there's kind of a, um, what about who's online? Andy, what do you think of that idea? Thumbs up or not? I, I think we should allow it, but I really doubt um, we'll see one there. I just don't think that model is profitable today, May, but I'd hate to Say no, because yep. I could be wrong. So I'm okay with it. Okay, great. Is that helpful, Leslie? I think Perfect. we're kind of mm -hmm. unanimous on that. Thank you. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Um, okay, uh, and then oops, go ahead. Well, I, I, I think those are all good comments, and I, uh, I buy that. Uh, I just, uh, is there a way of, of limiting the extent, I, I guess what I'm thinking is if somebody came in and wanted to do, to take up, you know, 25% of the, of the area for something commercial, as opposed to just a corner store. I think it was Scott and Angela that were the two that were really strong about this probably should be residential. Yes. Only here. Yes. And you could put the corner store for this corner down on 201, you know, on the parcels there that are zoned differently. Mm -hmm. So maybe we don't need to actually convert the annex part as well, mm -hmm. having a commercial option. That would be a heck of a walk, would it not? Yeah, it's a pretty good walk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I would leave it, leave it up to our coding experts to say, can you easily allow for what we're asking, which is yes. very limited, very yes. limited, not 25% of Right. So, just yeah. a little, just a, literally a little corner store. Got it. Yep. Yeah. I can do that. Um, and it would only be part, well, it would be part of an MPD. So it would be part of any redevelopment of this larger parcel. Um, yeah. So great. Yep. Perfect. Um, so the, that pretty much wraps up the annex question, except for one. And that is, what do we want to call it now? Because there was some discussion last time that we didn't want to call it the annex anymore. Hey. And you can just send me your like ideas and, you know, I don't know, we could do a poll online if we want to do that or something, unless there's an, an obvious choice. The appendage. Shunt. The appendage. <laughs> the appendage. <laughs> but, but if we're trying to use names people would recognize, we probably would just leave it at the top of some annex. Yeah. yeah I, I think mean, worse would be base housing. The thing is, whatever yeah. we call it, people will still call it the annex. Yeah. That's right. That's I think it's pretty thing. entrenched, that, that okay. term. Um, for now, yeah. Great. Wow, we got through a whole item. That's <laughs> <right>. amazing. <laughs> Um, okay, well, this is this is a great one as well. Um, the workshop building locations. Um, so now that um, that we aren't going to have, uh, so I'm going to try to enlarge this table um, from the code. So this is the um, building types by zone table, um, and 
actually, this one is a good one for discussing um, the suburban storefront questions, um, just reconfirming those as well. Um, so in terms of the workshop warehouse building, it was allowed in the annex. I'm going to remove that. Um, it is allowed in the Crooker district. Right. Um, and um, a big question that I have is, um, and somebody had had a comment similar, I think it was Rick, um, about um, Park Drive. Um, and I believe the uses that he was listing in their uh, grandpa's gardens or something, grandma's gardens, um, grandpa's gardens, a glass place. There are some light industrial uses um, or they kind of feel light industrial. They're kind of more artisan, I think, yeah. um, along Park Drive. And again, this is um, this is partially me struggling because I wasn't in on your conversations with Kate about this, this new map. Um, I consider Park Drive to be a pretty different area from uh, Thompson Fair Mall Road. Right. Um, and so I originally had this as its own zone, um, separate from Thompson Fair Mall Road. Um, but since it's now its own big zone, um, it kind of allows a lot of things to happen within it. Um, and I think that we probably need to allow the workshop warehouse building in it as well, um, because Park Drive kind of has that feel, even though there's a new multifamily building or set of buildings going in, right, yeah. that's actually moving forward. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think the chain, there's going to be a little shift um, over time along Park Drive with its access to Crooker and um, the Thompson Fair Mall. Um, but for the time being, I think we need to allow the workshop warehouse building there. Um, Rick had some comments or questions about loading specifically. And I think that that's what he was kind of getting at is that the workshop warehouse building allows for um, front or more uh, loading doors on it. Yeah. Um, so I just, I want to get a sense um, that we should allow it in the Thompson Fair Mall area. Unfortunately, it would be allowed everywhere unless we set some geographic parameters on it or something like that, which, you know, just makes it, makes everything a little bit um, messier. Um, the alternative would be to have a kind of Thompson Fair Mall one and two, um, where Park Drive is its own. Um, but I don't, you know, I'm just kind of trying to get at, again, I wasn't in on those conversations that you all had with Kate about defining this large area. Leslie, just to let you know, we did not, as a committee, get into the weeds on the Thompson Fair Mall. So don't assume that we actually gave more guidance there than you've already heard. We didn't. Yeah. Um, the, I, I think we were nervous about even um, sort of handling decision making around the Topsom Fair Mall as a whole, given given that it's it's you know where we do have some hope that over time there will be some shifts. Um, and if it makes sense in your mind, and I would open it up to our planning experts, is you know if it makes sense to have. Top, you know, tops and fair mall one and two zones. That nothing wrong with that. To to achieve what we'd like to see there. So let me um, start off by saying this: um, If we look at Park Drive today, there's a. I think it's a Home Hardware there. Is that? Over that. Home Hardware. Or Home Depot. It? Home Depot. Sorry. Yeah. Home yeah. Depot. Big old Home Depot. And which is a big box retail. There's the Goodwill store, which is sort of a form of a big box retail. Mm -hmm. The um, introduction of Market Basket is going to drive development in that area. And, you know, as we've seen from the 100 Park Drive application, some of it's going to be residential, but in all likelihood, there are going to be other forms of commercial development that wish to situate there as well. And Home Depot's not yet Park Drive, it's on the next street up. Okay, but I mean, in the general vicinity. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, 
those are the kinds of economic forces that will come to play in decisions that are made about park drive. Um, you know, what we know from our conversations with Dan Catlin and his consultants is that one of the reasons he wants to build uh, that residential development there is because he thinks there's going to be a, a lot of need for um, new residents to support the employees at Market Basket and other allied businesses that come in to develop there because they see Market Basket, Basket as an anchor tenant. So um, it, it could be, you know, some kind of mixed use area, but um, I wouldn't preclude the possibility of more big box development in that general facility, facility uh, vicinity, I should say. My view is that the, the new development that Dan Catlin has got going um, is, the, is, in a sense, is the interloper um, in, in terms of bringing residential multifamily to that particular location, but it's, um, it's a shift that we want to emphasize. You know, um, I, I'm, my sense is we're, we're not so keen on emphasizing more big box. I mean, that's part of what came through in the 2019 comp plan update process. Um, we've got plenty of those. They don't bring in value per acre. They just don't. Um, and retail is going through big torment right now. And we don't know how it's all going to shake out. Um, but we do need, desperately, housing. And so um, I'm not sure if, if in looking at this, Leslie, we want to expand. Does it make sense to you to expand to another street? I mean, Home Depot is on another street. Do we want to? look at beyond park drive um, um I, I mean we can i think i think what i would recommend is let's figure out what park drive is first okay um there's not a lot of i don't think that this is uh, i think that this is uh mostly drainage in here right. um, i think there's maybe some land here and here um, but i think in general we're talking mostly about park drive um, this area is outside, I think, of the yeah. limits. Yeah. Um, so the frontage along Park Drive, Home Depot doesn't front, it sort of backs up to these parcels on Park Drive, which again, I, I feel like there might be drainage in there as well. Um, I think my biggest question about Park Drive is there are not any large parcels, so it's not going to trigger MPD. These are going to be parcel by parcel developments. Right. Um, we can allow housing, um, but I think the biggest question is the light industrial that's there. Um, do we want that to expand? Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like a good location for it where it's already there. And we don't have other light manufacturing, light industrial areas really in the town. And right. where light industrial kind of um, borders with crafts, you know, um, and and that kind of thing, um, it, that, that doesn't make it pose any problems. One of the things we're learning from the applications that we're seeing coming through the door is there apparently is a huge undermet demand for storage facilities. Mm -hmm. More, we already and, have loads. Oh, and we've got we've got we've got more coming in everywhere. Yeah, uh, everywhere. off of one ninety six. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, I think the current owner of the big storage facilities that on park or somewhere nearby is maybe looking to expand as well. Um, so according to these entrepreneurs, there is, um, there's a lot of demand for additional storage facilities and, um, you know, that, that could very well be part of the picture, too. Does that fit in, Leslie? Or how how does that fit in with what we might want to see? And, and does that, um, I guess, does that call for a two-zone um, sequence in the Topsom Fair Mall area? 
Well, I, I think that, you know, do, do you agree that Thompson Fairmall Road and possibly Midway Drive as well, which I, I don't, I think it feels more like a driveway than a road, right? Um, but Thompson Fairmall Road and Midway have a different, um, they currently have a different feel. There are different activities going on in the and on those than on park. Um, right. And I think that the future is different on those than it is on park as well, probably. So my concern is that anything that we allow on park, if we keep it all one zone, is really going to be allowed on Thompson Fair Mall Road as well. Um, and so you you might get something that's more sort of light industrial like now. There are ways to like manage the design, um, and I think you know places like the Wicked Joe's that could have a coffee shop at the front or artisan uses that can have a sales place. Like I'm sure the glass shop probably sells to local people as well, isn't just a contractor supply. Mm -hmm. um, that can be you know a nice place. It doesn't have to be. We can we can put the um, the loading areas on the sides and and such, but. Um, so I think that there's some allowances to consider. There's some kind of gray areas in between, but just in general, if we want to allow for that kind of whole light industrial use without any kind of focus on consumers in the park drive area, we probably don't want that to occur on Thompson Fair Mall Road. I don't agree with that. Yeah, and historically we have had light industry it, as a non-allowed but contingent use in the mall, which I always wondered about. There was a candle factory for a while that went into a, I don't, it wasn't Marshall's, but it was Bradley's. a department store. Bradley's. Yeah, Bradley's. Yeah. So, and that just came in and I was like, wait, that's manufacturing. That's not a storefront. So we, we should be clear what we want and where. So I'm focused on top, the park drive issue and, and what it's gonna feel like if more light industrial comes in to the people who are living in the new development. Um, if we want to emphasize the residential nature of that area over light industrial, I, and, and I, I get confused when I'm thinking about, okay, what are we saying about the rest of the mall? Um, and what can be included there. One of the things that comes through in the plan is the possibility of some infill, I forget what it's called, but um, small incubator maker spaces, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. that's not retail, but what's wrong with that? Yeah. Yeah, I think we have we have that as a separate use, um, and it can occur in multiple multiple locations. In fact, in most codes today, they're sort of allowed everywhere, um, okay. but they're smaller in scale. And oftentimes, if they're in a particular location, you want them to have some kind of retail face to them, even if it's just a small, very small section. Um, so that's the gray area that I was talking about. That I think for the time being we're not talking about that when we're talking about park drive, when you're talking storage warehouses and light industrial. And also this is what we're talking about could happen on the backside of Crooker as well. Um, we wanna kind of keep that separate um, from what we will be allowing in the Thompson Fair Mall areas and pretty much all of the mixed use locations. I'm sorry, Andy, go ahead. Andy, go ahead. Yeah, um, so we're talking Park Road right here right now. There's no residential on Park Road. I don't think there's any plan, well, other than the one, you know, other than that new one that, uh, yeah, that's right. So will that, will that be the only residential? That For the be moment, on Park? but that's, that's a pretty big development, Andy, that's proposed. Yeah, but I don't, I don't see residential pods of residential along Park myself. I see the residential next to Goodwill because it's right next to Mallet Drive, which was also developed by Dan. Right. Do we think that some of these vacant spots along Park would be additional residential? I'm just asking the question. I'm, I, I, I never envisioned that be residential at all. 
Well, we don't know is a short answer right now, given our current code. I think that one of the things that we can keep in mind is that we're giving you sort of the tools for the future as well. And so the mixed residential, you know, that might even, uh, you know, the mixed residential that we're allowing up in the annex, and this is what I was trying to kind of get forward with the previous map, um, but that zone could always be rezoned to this area. If, for example, from this point south, you've got another residential development um, proposed, oops, um, it could be, it could be, a, you know, a small area. It doesn't have to be all of Park Drive. Perhaps right. what we do is we zone Park Drive with something that is more sort of um, we come up with a zone that would allow for a kind of a mixture. The problem is you have to be really careful about the kind of light industrial that you're allowing to happen near multifamily. Um, the maker spaces, the smaller scale, if there's going to be lots and lots of truck traffic kind of coming and going, I, you know, I, we want to be careful about that. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I guess I'm asking for a little bit more information about what you how these uses that exist up here function and whether or not you think that housing will function well with them. To some extent, it would be a function of you know whether there are sufficient buffering requirements between something like. Oh, uh, Home Depot, Home Depot. Home Depot, I get it mixed up with the Canadian chain. Uh -huh. And um, uh, I mean, you know, as we all know, there are lots of instances where there are adjoining residential and uh, light industrial, in some cases, heavier industrial sites. But those that work best are those that have some kind of sufficient buffer between the residential use and the adjoining use. So that could be part of the solution. Um, we're also seeing a lot of applications for solar farms these days. Hmm. Um, so who knows whether that may present itself at some point in the future. Um, Are we thinking that this area is in any way uh, conducive to solar farm development? I'm thinking, given the size of the parcels, that it's not. But am I incorrect? I wouldn't think so. Yeah. OK. So allowing some mixed use, being careful about it, <laughs> I think that's as far as we can get, Leslie. OK, well, but I'm not hearing necessarily mixed use. I'm hearing a mix of light industrial, mixed use right. across the board, light and mix of light industrial and housing. And housing, that's right, yeah. that's right. Um, and then, you know, of course we have the Goodwill store as well. So um, it's gonna be a kind of messy, messy zone. I mean, the other thing that we could do is sort of split it um, and everything North here be one thing and everything South be another. Yeah, what if you did that, Leslie, and you took the north part, and that's the Topsom Fair Mall 2 that's got mm -hmm. the light industrial, and then the rest of it is the, the mixed use slash retail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yep. Okay. like that. All right. Solution. Now, Andy, do you have another question, or are you, for the moment, you good? No, you're <laughs> muted. Nope. You're muted, Andy. He just needed to remove his. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah, good. I, I can't see myself in the screen for some reason, so I forgot it was raised. Sorry about that. Yeah, I no just problem. It. No problem. So um, where okay. are we, Leslie, on this agenda? We're we're we've talked about the item three, the yes. workshop building locations, park drive, blah blah blah. Right. Are we? Yes. So I think the so the way that this table is going to get revised, there's going to be a Topson Fair Mall too. Um, and you know we'll figure out the name later um, with workshop warehouse building as allowed, the general building as allowed, and so on. And then um, I'm removing the workshop building from the annex, and I am leaving it in the Crooker district. Right. That's right. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, so that's great. That's item number three. Um, I'm going to actually skip to some of the discussion since we're on this table about the suburban storefront and since it was kind of brought up the drive throughs in the beginning of the call. Um, so down to number seven. Yeah, some well, it's, I it's confirmation. It was going to be confirmation, but I think there's still some outstanding questions that I wasn't aware of. So, um, in terms of the suburban storefront, the way that this is going to change is we're removing it from the upper village. Right. Um, we are limiting it with it just has uh, planning board approval in the Crooker district, and it will be allowed by right in Thompson Fair Mall. I think that's where our discussion was. And if there's further massaging, we can hear um, that now. A, a number of months back, we received a, an initial sketch plan proposal from Dan Catman for a mixed use development in 99 Main Street, which would include a grocery store, and probably other some smaller retails. Now, does would that exclude this from uh, the suburban storefront building? That wouldn't be a suburban storefront. That's uh, not what he was proposing. No, he was proposing just regular storefront buildings, like traditional storefronts. Yeah, it's the same one that I saw. Right, it is the same one. Okay, all right. Yeah, it was multi. So you're talking about the parcel across from the town hall, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 I didn't think grocery store was in there at all. I thought it was just traditional storefront. Uh, no, he had specifically mentioned a grocery store at that time. So that's why I'm asking. But is that something that we're so, okay, so we're looking at Upper Village and whether or not the suburban storefront is going to be allowed. That's not what Dan was proposing, a suburban storefront. How do you want to address that, Hap? Well, my understanding of his conceptual plan at that time was that it was going to include a grocery store. But it's not. it was not a su suburban storefront building. And I think that's what Leslie, uh, Leslie, are you asking for guidance on that right now in terms of the confirmation of not allowing it in certain areas except, yeah. I, I thought that, that we discussed that we weren't going to allow it. Um, and that would be a single use, single story building. Um, and then just to right. make it okay. a little bit more complicated, it's, you know, drive throughs So, um, but Traditional storefront is a minimum of two stories in height. So it's a multi-story building built along the street with multiple uses um, within it. Um, and so I think that one of the things that HAP is bringing up, HAP, tell me if I've got this wrong, um, but is that we have this allowance for a double height or a taller building um, in the suburban storefront. Um, and if if it was a grocery store planned for that location, then it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't fit in really. No, it, 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 at the time it wasn't. It was going to be a grocery store on the ground level and likely residential up above. Oh, okay. Well, then that's fine. That that yeah. would be allowed. Okay. okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. So that's just to confirm that. Now um, we do have. Uh, or Kate had shown the Topsom Fair Mall site uh, zone extending over to this intersection. Um, Which I think is Monument Place, is that right? That's a long Monument Place and it is up to, um, so it incorporates um, these parcels here. Right up to the corner or not quite? Uh, includes bootleggers and that car wash. Oh, okay. That makes sense. I think. Oh, well, except that for the is. topography. It goes up to here. Okay. Grabs okay. all of this. And so the, the gas thinking, station, the Duncan. Yeah. And I think the thinking there, Leslie, is that that offers some good potential for sort of walkable 
um, mixed use buildings so that, you know, it sort of promotes that kind of walkable area um, in, very, in very close proximity to the town office, the post office and whatever. So um, the Topsom Fair Mall, if it allows for the suburban storefront by right anywhere, then that is, um, it's basically fairly consistent with what is, and this is all, much of this is pretty new, right? In here? Yeah, past 15 years. Yeah. So it basically allows that same type of development. Now, the suburban storefront is better than what you've been getting in terms of strip centers and so on. It has, you know, the sort of dual walkability as well as, you know, an automobile um, focus to it. Um, but it's still, so the idea that this area is maybe perhaps not quite as walkable as this section of Monument Place would be um, as part right. of the upper village. It, I just want to confirm that. So just with your cursor, just show where that that where that where ends right there. Okay, thank you. Yep, yep. And as it's currently constructed, you're right, Leslie, that's certainly less walkable than the area to the right of it. So yeah. There is a sidewalk along Monument Place. There always is. It's a very nice sidewalk too. Oh, I, I, I take that back. The Thompson Fair Mall doesn't have Thompson Fair Mall Road doesn't have one, right? Right. That's correct. Um. Okay. So are we? This is this is then. This is accurate. It, it certainly feels like the mall there. You know, as far as what mm. currently exists. Yeah. Any comments that would alter that? Okay, you've got your confirmation, Leslie. Okay, just in terms of drive through facilities, the way that we were thinking about it before, and the current draft doesn't necessarily show this because it doesn't have the accessory structures um, section in it. Um, we discussed last time, and we would do this anyway, adding some design constraints. So either putting it on uh, the rear or the interior side of the building as opposed to a corner side of the building or the front. Um, and uh, there wouldn't be, you wouldn't be allowed to sort of do this whole circle drive through um, where the building was sort of surrounded by street. The front of the building would um, need to be up against, you know, sidewalk area. Um, so like the suburban storefront images that are in the code. Um, so we can establish those design standards associated with drive-through facilities. And what we were contemplating before the code re revision, the major revision, was that the drive-throughs would only be allowed on the suburban storefront, which would mean that anywhere where we're limiting um, the suburban storefront would be how drive-throughs would be limited. So again, not in the urban village, so therefore, no drive-throughs would be allowed in the in in the upper village. Sorry, upper village. Yeah. Um, Thompson Fair Mall would be allowed by right, so drive-throughs would be allowed by right. Yep. Yeah. And then in the Crooker District, drive-throughs would be allowed with plan, uh, suburban storefront would be allowed with planning board approval, um, yeah. and therefore drive-throughs would be allowed as part of that. So, do you want to weigh in any further? Andy Sturgeon, in terms of no, the the kind the the nuanced pushback you've been getting. <laughs> well, I guess I I was just I, I was thinking I didn't want to restrict them completely in there. Right. Nor do I think I, when I say me, I guess I didn't think the community wanted to restrict them completely for a couple reasons. Again, one is we've been leaning a lot recently towards pickup type things because of the pandemic um we're getting out of that but uh, they can be tastefully designed today i we don't need to have that open concept like the dunkin donuts that that um leslie was talking about when you, where you've got cars you've got cars queuing up 26 in a row circling the building no and yeah. having trying to have pedestrians and that walkability trying to cut through those cars you can you can design it so it isn't that way but yeah. to just completely outlaw them, I didn't want that. And that's not what we're doing. So I'm okay with this. Great. 
Uh, although I think it does make sense as Leslie said to outlaw them on Main Street. You know, Main, yes. Lower yeah. so yes. I, I think you've got a good compromise, Leslie. Okay. So I just want to throw a little bit of a tiny wrench in that, and that is banks. Um, so I think we're mostly thinking about food drive throughs um, and uh, banks and pharmacies have become a kind of, you know, and those might occur in another building type. Do we want to allow those as well? Um, or do you have any concerns about, um, you know, limiting drive throughs in those in other buildings? Um, for banks or financial institutions and possibly pharmacies. Well, if, if, if you if you eliminate drive-throughs with those, you're not going to get them there at all. Period. You're not going to get the the mm -hmm. banks. Mm -hmm. Can we eliminate the number of drive-through windows? I mean, every time I drive by, I think it's called the Five County Bank or something. I think there's something like five drive-through portals. I think. I look at it and I go, is it really necessary to have all these portals? Mm -hmm. You know, it one or two maybe, but five. But I think one of the things that where people have been firm in their desire is is no more drive-throughs in certain areas. Um, and so I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, anyone is I, I think the the strength of that opinion came down on main street mm -hmm. um it's like no more <laughs> period um and then when we look at other areas um you know i, th I think if it's a different building type but it makes sense for what's on the ground floor to have in like in the crooker district to have a drive-through in what's on the ground floor meeting the specifications that you're going to set up, Leslie, that makes sense to me. Like the Bangor Savings in Brunswick, it, it seems like it's two stories <laughs> on the street. It is. And, but they've done what Leslie suggests with a drive through and got it kind of hidden out back and yeah. you don't see it from the street. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's, where I, that's where I don't want to restrict it. I don't know that we'll have any there, but at the same time, I'd hate to restrict them completely. I just if you could have some design criteria that would govern where the, where the windows go and 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 then we'll, we're going to have those anyway right what we're going to have those design standards we just need to make sure they apply to this concern mark which which bank were you talking about in brunswick bangor savings it's on main street okay. right at the corner of main and mason and they spell main with the e on the end yeah hmm. okay um, yeah, so I will let me propose something in in this next draft and um, and then we'll address it. I think I have enough information to kind of move forward on on drive throughs. Thank you. That's really, Great. really helpful. Um, so just before Leslie, we move just, on, Joe had something, I think. Yeah, could, then... Leslie, could you pull up that uh, the uh, image of the bank that you had not in plan in elevation? Yeah. Where'd it go? There it is. It's right there. I always think it has more trees around it than it does. <laughs> yeah, uh, good, thanks. Um, rotate back. Well, it doesn't, my, I was looking at that and thinking about walking in that area. And there's a sea of asphalt devoted to automobiles. Yeah. And this piddling little uh, sidewalk for people, I mean, that's a pretty intimidating landscape yes. uh, for somebody to uh, navigate on foot. So I I, I understand Adney's uh, point, uh, and I, I concur. Uh, I guess I'd like to think that there are ways of designing uh, a, another facility similar to that that doesn't present this, uh, this intimidating uh, you know, landscape for uh, for pedestrians. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will let me let me do. I think it would be better to be talking from a drawing. Um, but I think part of the problem is there's too 
two driveways um, and the driveways are wider than they really need to be here as well. But then you have a sea of asphalt next to it with the used car lot. And then you've got oh, the, well, that's, the, yeah, that's the terrible. apron with, uh, you know, for the fire trucks, which I, uh, you know, granted is absolutely necessary, but uh, it's a lot. It's a lot of asphalt. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Um, just one other consideration, Leslie, in, in, in terms of the drive throughs and is it possible to somehow make a distinction between drive throughs for banks and you know, pharmaceutical stores and all that and fast food joints, because typically the lineup for fast food joints, and especially something like Dunkin' Donuts, gets extraordinarily long and sometimes it packs out onto the public street or a highway. And so what can we do to kind of better control that if we're going to allow drive-throughs for those types of uh, uh, commercial operations. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 let me do some drawings and um, and send those send those around, and I think that that will settle the concern because there is a way to kind of get it to wrap around the back and only have one entrance. Um, there's some good examples of that. I think I showed one last time in the meeting. Yeah, right. and in particular, to sort of find ways to limit the um, stacking, the stacking that that backs up onto, you know, public rights away. In case we get a Chick Fil A. Yeah. <laughs> well, even Dunkin' Donuts right now is pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Starbucks. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, so that that I think takes care of that. Um, so I've got a couple of very specific questions. Um, and one of them was Rick's, um, but I think it's I think it's worthy of a bit of discussion. Um, the frontage along uh, 196. Um, so let me just let me pull it up. Um, what I was assuming we were doing um, with the sort of focus on Monument Place is the walkable street or and and I guess Hort, Horton as well um, is that 196 would be the backside as it kind of is now because there's not access off of it, um, but that we would have some treatment, uh, some landscape, a landscape buffer for these through lots. And I think that this is what Rick's question was about, but since he's not here, I don't know if we can confirm that, but I just want to make sure that, you know, what I am thinking is that the, the front of these sort of um, through parcels would be either Monument Place or Horton Place, as opposed to fronting on, on um, 196. 196. Now, I have not, I still haven't seen Aroma Joe's. I would love to see the design for Aroma Joe's because um, everybody talks about it all the time and nobody's ever sent it to me. It's not too photogenic. We can send you pictures. You don't have any plans? Oh, I'm sure we do. Yeah, there should be a set of design plans at, uh, at the town office. Sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> So which way does it, which, where's its front? Second Street. It is on second. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then it has a drive through right? Yes. And is the drive through on the main street side or where? It's on second as well. The building fronts main street and then the drive throughs in the back and you get to the parking lot in the drive through from second street. Oh, okay. So the front is main. Okay. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Okay. And there, there was an issue with their sign. They put it too close to 196 because they were trying to get on the other side of the trees they planted for landscaping. Um, but they had to move the siding back, sign back closer to the building. So as the trees grow up, you're not really going to see the sign from 196 anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> um, well, so I, I think that that's 
what he was referring to, what Rick was referring to. So there won't be as many, since this is this parcel, it'll really just be these parcels in here um, should they redevelop. Um, because these would front on Horton, I would assume. Their access is going to have to be for monument because it's controlled access on the bypass. So it does seem to make sense to have the back, so to speak, be the bypass and the front be the monument. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess um, we can ask Rick later. Um, okay. Joe, this is your comment from Monday. Um, you had expressed concern that we were losing um, the node here um, at Elm, the, the older historic node here at Elm. And I don't know if you recall this, but that's, um, I had sort of defined that as the, the sort of mixed use shopping restaurant retail kind of node for Main Street. But there was a lot of discussion and it um, it all was reinforced by the comprehensive plan that the idea is from that the whole lower village area could eventually probably become that. Yes. Um, so <laughs> I know Susan is gonna like chime in here. So <laughs> yeah, I I'm gonna have to back off on that because uh, my 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 perception of that area is that uh, the the intersection of Elm and Main was uh, is all that's left of uh, the original center of, of town, and I was viewing it from kind of an historic uh, perspective with the scale of the buildings, yada yada. Um, granted, that's not particularly attractive, but. Um, <laughs> But I, I understand and I, you know, I've got to let go of that. Um, are so. you are you thinking more about because um, this is all south of Elm right here? Yeah. And if are you if you look right at the node of Elm and Maine, that's a different. Um, that's where the zone transitions. Right. Yeah. So I. I you right, know, that's the house. Yeah, I've yeah. got to let go of of that. There's just so so little of the fabric of the original part, the historic part of the town left, the commercial part, um, that I was I was just viewing it differently. But it's, well, just consider that we did we did model the building types um, sort of based on these, mm, so we are true. recalling them. Yeah. Go ahead. Andy's got his hand up. Yeah. Um, when you said this, Joe, I, being someone that's new in town, relatively new, four or five years, I look at that Elm Street um, as the transition area. I look at from Sea Dog up to Elm as being that lower village. I thought that was, at, mm -hmm. and it's flatter. Um, it is kind of steep right at that intersection. And when you were saying it might have been that way many, many years ago, but to me, it, it looks like a beautiful spot to transition right there at elm so i was yeah. not that i was going to push back too bad but i i, I just <laughs> as someone knew it looked that way to me yeah well i'm new too just not quite as new but i mean obviously the fact that that was has been established for some time um i'm i'm kind of out in left field here i think obviously other people view it the same way so i i'm i don't feel the need to spend any more time on it but let me just ask the question Joe, in terms of the concern that you're feeling, what would you like to see? That's the problem. Ah, yeah. okay. I don't, I don't know. Okay. I think with the lay of the land there, probably the current use is about all it could ever be. Yeah. Because you've got that yellow house that's almost in the street, and then it's a steep banking to the stream behind it. That gully is really limiting. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. To that whole side of. So for the next like half mile up until yeah. you. You really can't all do much way. other than the residential stuff yeah, that's there. It's right? all the way to Wilson. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. the other thing we need to take into account is that's a high traffic area. Yes. Um, and it's really a thoroughfare from Brunswick into Thompson. And so whatever we enable in there needs to be mindful of the volumes of traffic that go through there. 
that's actually kind of a good segue to your other comment, Joe, that that you haven't brought up again, but was in your the written comments on the draft mm -hmm. um, about the zero setback concern. And um, we did have we do have so this these are built right up to the edge of the right of way. And we do have a um, we did in the original uh, a requirement. Oh, thank you, Julie. Um, for uh, pedestrian area. Um, so if it is this close, then there's a requirement um, and I'll confirm that it it stayed in the code. I'm pretty sure it did the minimum streetscape area in front. So if something new were to get built, it would have to have um, a little bit more space. So does that make you more comfortable? Absolutely, yeah, it's that. I mean, this is where my concern about the historic character falls apart because that's about as intimidating a pedestrian walkway as um, you know as, as the upper Main Street that we looked at earlier. So yeah, that would that would certainly be helpful. There's a gauntlet-like aspect to parts of Main Street that make it make it very unfriendly for the pedestrians. At the same time, the it, it, tell me if I'm wrong, Leslie and Kirk, but that um, gauntlet feeling or buildings up closer to the street tends to slow traffic, does it not? Vehicular traffic. And slowing vehicular traffic a little bit is not a bad thing. I mean, the speed limit there is lower than most of the traffic goes. That doesn't yeah. mean they're grabbing the speed limit. Right. That's what she said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I live not far from that that intersection of, of Elm and Main, and uh, I am regularly observing a lot of traffic, much of which is going well beyond 25 miles an hour. Um, and so if we were to enable more development in that vicinity, how do we provide access and egress to those sites? And how does it affect the flow of traffic? It certainly has to be some thought given to that, because I, I walk that area too, and it's almost as scary as walking across the bridge. Not quite. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So um, that, I think that most, uh, oh, there's one more, well, two more questions. Um, one is Rick had a question about the uh, number of row buildings or the, the allowance for row building types mm -hmm. um, pretty much everywhere. Um, and I think that that's, uh, the row building can be used for a lot of different uses. It could be a mixed use building. It could have um, different, you know, commercial on the ground floor or not commercial or offices and then upper living and so on. So it's a really flexible building type and it's a really common building type in the area, um, not in Topsom really yet, but in the older historic areas. Um, right. So I'm wondering if anybody has any sense of his concern about that question. Um, in in I terms do, of it everywhere. I do not, but we can relay this to him. And um, let's just ask the question of, is there anyone else concerned about, I mean, I remember one of our very, very earliest sessions with you, Leslie, when we really didn't have our minds wrapped around this, what you were presenting to us at all, but you know the idea that this is one of the most flexible building types came through, I think, very clearly. Does anyone else have a concern about allowing this everywhere? You mean on Main Street or all in all of these zones? Okay. Row building allowed everywhere. Just to clarify, does that mean attached storefronts, but with two stories? It's two or three story, two or three story. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's I mean, just vertically oriented with doors. You know, it's a row, like a row house. Yeah. Thanks. That's what I was picturing. I just wanted to be sure. Yeah. Okay. So I will check in with Rick about his concern, but and if there is anything that's going to alter 
the flow of what you're doing. We'll get it to you. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I think that's all of the comments that I had. Okay. So then, oh, somehow it fell off vinyl. Um, vinyl siding. Um, so there was a kind of a long exchange um, on the comments about whether or not to allow vinyl. Um, and I had it as pink. Um, right. And uh, so it is, it is one of those materials that, um, as Joe has pointed out a couple of times, is um, generally not considered to be sustainable. It has a lot of issues. Um, I'm sure we all know what happens when it burns. Um, but I don't have it allowed as a major facade material right now. Um, there are lots of other possibilities for siding looking, you know, whether it's wood or fiber cement um, or metal. Um, but I, you know, I know that Julie brought up some affordability questions. And so I just wanted to test, um, you know, the vinyl siding folks will come out. <laughs> I don't know if they'll come out in Maine, but they've come out for every other project that I've ever had um, to, to let us know that, you know, they should be allowed everywhere. Um, um, but right now, there's a question of whether or not it should be a minor material or um, allowed as a major material and maybe limited to particular building types. Um, I would say that as a material, th the look of your sort of main building types is, you know, your main with an E on the end of it, focused building types is that kind of siding look um, and finish. And so allowing, I would typically allow it on those kinds of buildings, but we're talking about pretty much every building for you guys. Um, so I don't know how everybody feels about it. So Leslie, just for clarity, are you talking about not using vinyl all around building or just on the front facade? Um, well, let's see. That's a good question. Uh, major facade opportunity in the primary service for all of all facades. I think we uh, early on um, the discussion was um, all facades. Now we do have this allowance for side and rear facades to use an approved minor material everywhere. Um, that that would mean you know if those side and rear facades were not visible. Um, then the enforcement code enforcement officer could allow that. So that's that's written in there. Um, what, again, we have minor and major facade materials. So the split difference, I believe, is 65-35 um, for all facades. So each facade measured separately. Um, and then in terms of accent and details, we do allow vinyl soffits and trim and such. So we're just talking about the surface of those facades and whether or not we're limiting them to 35%, a maximum of 35% and making them only a minor material or allowing them on 65% of the facades and that would make it a major material. Julie, correct me if I'm wrong. We had someone with a historic district committee about a month ago redoing one of the buildings on Lower Main Street and he wanted to use vinyl. Mm -hmm. And the historic district committee said, at least currently, they said we couldn't object to the vinyl as much as we'd like to, but he wanted to do vinyl shingles. And they're like, no, you can't do vinyl shingles, that'd be vinyl clapboard, because that's what kind of fits what's there mm -hmm. historically. Yeah. Um, and they were encouraging him to do wood on the front facade yeah, right. and mm -hmm. put vinyl on the yes. other side. Okay, so we could write it like that um were, were they okay with fiber cement yeah they would have been okay with fiber cement okay so that just tells me you know that we're kind of on the same page um excellent uh, on your wood leslie does that include engineered wood like the lp smart side or something yeah that's, that's yeah. more affordable than i think some so. of the other options so um actually uh -huh. Leslie, quick question on the, uh, the designation of the thickness 
Um, I think it was 0.040 or for the vinyl. It, is that, uh, I mean, there's a whole range of vinyl, uh, obviously. Does that get us to something that's sufficiently rigid uh, that it doesn't look uh, cheap? Look really Dent cheap. Dentable. Yeah, it's, it's in the middle. It's in the middle. Okay. Yeah, it's in the middle. Um, and I mean, would that, that pertain to the trim and soffits as well, if that were chosen? No. I've seen, um, I've seen yes, it does. It's actually this. Okay. I'm sorry, say that again. Oh, ju just that I've seen soffits that are so flimsy, they sag. Yeah. Well, I think they're going to still sag, but this size, but, um, <laughs> but I do have that size and I will, I can go back and verify that. Um, it's been a while since I, I researched that, but, um, but yes, that's what I have. Um, yes, it's the same size, same thickness. Um, I will add, I, I agree, Mark, about the, the composite wood. Um, and I, for some reason I didn't do that here. And I'm not sure why. Um, I have composite as a minor material. Some of them are starting to look really plasticky, but mm -hmm. if you haven't had that experience, then um, I will I will add those. Oh, well, can you it. add those um, materials that don't look particularly plasticky? <laughs> I. <laughs> I, it's really hard to to figure out um, what's going to trigger that. Um, I will try. I'll, okay. I'll do some more research and try and see if I can figure it out. Um, you know, writing writing the code, it become. I'm trying to kind of write. That's why. And Joe had this experience with the term composite. Um, and just what what exactly does that mean? I'm trying to be or engineered. I'm trying to be flexible with those some of those new materials that can replace wood. And um, it's just that it's just this sort of constantly changing set of materials. Um, and I, I feel like that engineered or composite sort of grabs most of those. Um, one of the things that I can also do, which I'm sure I have in here, is that you can get planning board approval. I think I can do this, right, Kirk, um, for other materials, if I write it specifically. Yeah, that's what we had discussed. It seemed to be acceptable when we talked to the attorneys about it. So, Chili, does that area fall under the Historic District Commission? Um, well, so this is by building and not by area, right? Uh, yeah. By I thought we were just kind of referencing the lower village area as part of this discussion. Well, no, lower village is part of it, but okay. No, this is just that building. Yeah, so these apply to all of them. Although I will say the village shop front and the traditional storefront are more in the village. Well, I need to change these because we now just have one village building. Um, that's a good. Well, they're still going to have to comply with the village district, the historic district right. anyway from that section. So maybe we don't have to have the planning board approve the siding. It's just the people in the village need to have that extra level. They have, still have to go get the historic, the historic district approval. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But these building types are allowed in other areas. Right. Um, Which I'm saying maybe we don't need to have the planning board judging siding in other areas, but we just rely on the historic district to judge the siding in the historic area. Oh, That's so in other words, be more open and allow most of them in the other areas, and then just the historic district would be more particular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that everybody agree with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Perfect. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna leave the vinyl siding um, only on side and rear, and as a minor material. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll see what we we'll see what pushback we experience. Right. Okay. Um, I think that's all I got. <laughs> that is wonderful. Um, and we're so because we're right on time, like perfect. <laughs> oh wow! Um, yeah. You know, so just 
give a rough sense, Leslie, you're obviously going to do some additional stuff here. And I guess, and I'm not saying this in any way to rush you, I'm just trying to think about when it makes sense, so, sort of if and when it makes sense for uh, CPIC and the planning board to work together to have some kind of open house public um, event around the center of town apart from, you know, because that's where the big change is. The rest of it is people need to be informed, but there's not going to be any big, you know, shock factor in the work that Kirk is doing. If <laughs> right, Kirk, no shock factor. <laughs> Um, but I think there's going to be a process of both with stakeholders, the landowners and developers who are not necessarily top some residents to need to weigh in here and um, before we get too far down the road. So I guess those are the questions in my mind and anything you can say at this point, even roughly to give me a little bit of a time sense because the, the whole public process is sort of, you know, it's going to be so important. And at the same time, the only thing I'm envisioning is what we did for the, um, the update process where we had a, a totally different thing going on in terms of the plan. Um, and people still talk about how wonderful that event was at the library, you know, where they could look at photographs and put sticky notes. And um, so I'm just wondering how this might work. And we don't need to spend time on this right now, but maybe you and I can do a little offline noodling about this. Are you thinking of that event with uh, Wesley and Kirk? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, well let let me let me get you a revised draft. Yep. And a map, a revised map, which I need to work with Julian. And actually, that's that is the biggest question for me because I'm not sure <laughs> I'm not sure how we're going to do that. Um, and so, I I I think by when is your next CPIC meeting? Is it the tenth? Yes, the next that's with the next regular meeting would be the tenth of April. Um, I'm, I have vacation, so that makes it very hard for me to say it will take, I think in about two weeks I can have it done, but I don't think I can have it done by the 10th, by the 17th. Um, well, I can we, get you. We'll have a workshop session on the 18th. Oh, April. okay. Okay. Great. How does that look? That's looking good, right? Yep. <laughs> um, Susan, I've got one last question. If no one else says. Sure, uh, that helps Leslie in terms of just you know pinpointing that. That's great. Go ahead. So um, Leslie, under six, section six point four zero civic and institutional use group and and six point four zero one community assembly, I didn't see any reference in there to institutions like transition shelter shelter. So uh, you know, for example. Uh, you know, uh, a woman's shelter that, or for women who are uh, getting out of um, exploitive relationships and that sort of thing, um, would that be a natural fit within that that uh, paradigm? That's a Kirk Kirk question. Um, I'm trying so, to Kirk. I'm trying to find the uses section so that I can pull it up for you. Yeah. Article six. Um, in the draft thus far, Hap, the types of shelters that you're referring to are classified mm -hmm. as a group living use because they are kind of residential in nature. They're called out as emergency or protective shelters under 6.30.2. Um, but but um but we've done it different ways in different places so I, I think that's a topic that we can begin to explore at the with the planning board um as we as we look at the use table and 
the classifications generally and where things are allowed. I'm ex I'm anticipating yeah, just, a fair amount of discussion about that. I mean, I I just think that maybe it would be helpful to add it under 6.40.1 as a specific type of use that would be enabled. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying about it being generally captured elsewhere, but um, 6.40.1 also gets a little more descriptive about the types of uses and so I, it, it, it's just something that, you know, caught my eye. Yeah, well, I think that the, the essence of the question is, is it a group living use or community assembly use? Because it can't be both, uh, at least in the way we write use classifications, they're mutually exclusive. Um, right. But uh, I don't know that there's a wrong answer to how we classify it and where it's permitted. Um, so I'm happy to continue that discussion with you. Okay. Is that going to be in the section that you all tackle on Thursday evening or later? It is in the material that's been provided to the planning board in advance of Thursday's meeting. Okay. The ex Whether we get to it or not, there's a is fair amount of material in there, so I can't answer yeah. that, but yeah. Seven and that's it. Six. Okay, got it. Terrific. All right. Thank you all. Yeah. This is wonderful. We actually got through that whole big agenda, and mm -hmm. uh, you're on your way. Yep. Sounds all good. Right. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Good Thanks, everyone.